In this module, we will be discussing about the congenital mitral valve lesions. Congenital mitral valve lesions can clinically manifest with either mitral stenosis or mitral incompetence. The various morphological lesions that might present with congenital mitral stenosis include parachute mitral valve where all the mitral valve cordae are attached to a single papillary muscle, a double orifice mitral valve where there are two orifices both of which are anatomically smaller so giving a smaller valve area, a supramitral ring or a supramitral membrane, mitral valve hyperplasia, accessory mitral valve tissue which protrudes into the mitral valve inflow region or anomalous mitral arcade or a hammock mitral valve. Supramitral ring refers to a membrane that is attached to the region of the mitral annulus and protrudes into the mitral inflow thereby restricting the effective valve area. In this parasternal long axis view we can see a thick membrane that is attached to the basal portions of the mitral valves and causing an inflow obstruction. On an apical four chamber view when we magnify the mitral valve apparatus we are able to see a thick fleshy membrane attached to the mitral annulus and the basal portions of the mitral valve leaflets and protruding into the mitral valve inflow region. A color Doppler interrogation shows the inflow obstruction caused by the supramitral ring. In this magnified parasternal long axis view we can appreciate the membrane that is attached to the posterior and anterior mitral leaflets. We can also see a dilated coronary sinus in the mitral annulus which will represent persistence of the left superior vena cable patency through the coronary sinus into the right atrium. Some of the supramitral rings may be very small nubbin of tissue without a substantial inflow obstruction. Sometimes it can be very fleshy and protrude significantly into the mitral inflow thereby causing significant mitral stenosis. A Doppler interrogation of the mitral inflow gradients will reveal the severity of mitral stenosis caused by this supramitral ring. We have a mean gradient of 12 millimeters of mercury and a peak gradient of 22 millimeters of mercury in this patient with supramitral ring. On a three dimensional echocardiogram, after we crop the roof of the atria, we are able to visualize the left atrium from above. We can see the dilated left atrial appendage anteriorly. We can notice a circumferential supramitral ring that is protruding above the level of the mitral valve leaflet orifice. We can also see the right atrium on the right side. In this patient with single ventricle, there is a malpost great artery. So the pulmonary valve is posterior and the iota is anterior. Another cause of mitral stenosis is parachute mitral valve. In parachute mitral valve, all the cordae are attached to a single large group of papillary muscle. The appearance of a single papillary muscle with all the cordae converging towards that papillary muscle will appear like a parachute. We can appreciate the mitral inflow gradients on this epical view caused by the parachute mitral valve. When we see the short axis of the ventricle and assess the valve opening in the parachute mitral valve, the valve will have an eccentric opening since all the caudal apparatus will be converging towards a papillary muscle which has got an eccentric attachment. Lower down we can appreciate that there is only one single papillary muscle in 5 o'clock position in the cavity of the left ventricle. On the same patient, in the parasternal short axis view, 
we can appreciate again the eccentric opening of the mitral valve apparatus converging on to your papillary muscle which is located at around 8 o'clock position. The previous view that was shown in the previous slide was a subsified short axis view of the left ventricle whereas this is a parasternal short axis view of the same left ventricle. The single parachute papillary muscle can be located in any portions of the left ventricle. In this second example of parachute mitral valve, we can appreciate that the papillary muscles are getting attached to between the 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock position of the left ventricle in subsified short axis view. Double orifice mitral valve is another abnormality that can clinically manifest with congenital mitral stenosis. In this parasternal long axis view, we are able to appreciate two eccentric orifices of the mitral valve apparatus. The left atrium is dilated compared to the anterior aortic root and there are two color flow signals from the left atrium into the left ventricle both with turbulence indicating the presence of mitral stenosis. When we look at the short axis of the left ventricle from a parasternal window, we are able to appreciate a larger anterior orifice of the mitral valve and a smaller posterior orifice of the mitral valve. So these are the two orifices of the double orifice mitral valve. Both these orifices will have separate groups of cardiopapillary apparatus. On an epical view, we can appreciate the left ventricle above and left atrium below and the two jets of the mitral valve inflow, both having turbulence due to presence of mitral stenosis. On a three-dimensional echocardiogram, the short axis of the left ventricle is shown from below after cropping off the apical and mid portion of the left ventricles. There are two mitral valve orifices shown with two arrows. The mitral valve orifice shown above is larger in its valve area and the valve orifice that is seen inferiorly is the smaller orifice. Some of the mitral valves may be hypoplastic and dysplastic. We can appreciate in this patient a hugely dilated left atrium indicating the mitral inflow obstruction. We can see a thick, dysplastic, less mobile mitral valve apparatus. While discussing the various causes of mitral stenosis of congenital origin, we will briefly touch upon lutum basher syndrome. Lutum Basher syndrome is association of a congenital heart disease namely secondum atrial septal defect along with a rheumatic mitral stenosis. This is a patient with rheumatic severe mitral stenosis along with an atrial septal defect that causes enlargement of the right atrium and right ventricle. All patients with congenital mitral stenosis should be assessed very carefully for any distal left ventricular outflow tract abnormalities. It may be associated with either coarctation or aortic arch interruption. This is a patient who has a supramitral ring with a mild mitral inflow obstruction. We can notice that the left ventricular free wall is quite thick and there is a left ventricular hypertrophy. So in this patients, we should carefully look for presence of arch obstruction. Suprasternal long axis view of the aortic arch in the same patient shows a type A aortic arch interruption. The ascending aorta continues as the three arch branches and then gets interrupted. The main pulmonary artery continues as the PDA into the descending thoracic aorta. When a patient presents with congenital mitral stenosis, if you do a pulse oximetry of the right arm and leg, you will be able to appreciate a differential cyanosis which will indicate a clue towards the presence of aortic arch interruption. 
we will move on to various reasons for congenital mitral valve regurgitations. One of the most common cause of congenital mitral regurgitation is cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet, very often a component of heavy septal defects. However, isolated mitral valve clefts are also reported and they can lead to mitral regurgitation. Some of the dysplastic mitral valves can have severe mitral regurgitation. The secondary reasons for mitral regurgitations will include alkappa, dilated cardiomyopathy of any reason with mitral annular dilatation, other connective tissue disorders, storage disorders, and mitral valve annular dilatation associated with large left right shunts. It may also be seen in congenital mitral valve prolapse syndrome. In this parasternal short axis view, we are able to appreciate the cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet. The cleft is directed towards the intraventricular septum. The anterior mitral leaflet is divided into two halves and the cleft contributes to the mitral regurgitation. The cleft is caused by the zone of opposition between the remnants of superior bridging leaflet and inferior bridging leaflets of an AV septal defect. We can appreciate with a color Doppler interrogation that the mitral regurgitation is originating from the cleft region. When there is a cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet, the edges of the cleft, which represents the zone of opposition between the superior and inferior bridging leaflets, gets rolled up, thickened and progressively results in worsening of the mitral regurgitation. Cleft of this anterior mitral leaflet that is directed towards the intraventricular septum is often associated with a large primum atrial septal defect in partial AV canals. In this four chamber view of transesophageal echocardiogram, we are able to appreciate the central jet of mitral regurgitation caused by the cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet. On a three-dimensional atrial on view of the AV valves, we are able to appreciate that the mitral valve is appearing as a three-leaflet structure. The leaflet on the left hand of the screen is the left mural leaflet. The two leaflets on the right hand of the screen will represent the superior and inferior bridging leaflets and the gap between the two is the cleft or the zone of opposition between the superior and inferior bridging leaflet. We can notice that in AV septal defects, the cleft is directed towards the intraventricular septum. On the ventricular on fast view, we are able to appreciate the cavity of the left ventricle. We are viewing the left ventricle on its basal portion after cropping off the mid and apical regions. We can appreciate the cleft directed towards the intraventricular septum and the mitral valve appears as a tri-leaflet structure. On the left hand of the screen, you can also appreciate a dilated right ventricle and the dilated tricuspid annulus caused by the association of large primum atrial septal defect in these patients. On the two still frames, we show the cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet. On the left hand side, we see the atrial on fast view and the right hand side, we see the ventricular on fast view. Common atrium is also associated with cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet. Common atrium in many patients also have chondroectodermal dysplasia in Ellis Van Crevel syndrome, which is an autosomal recessive condition. In this condition, the left superior vena cava often drains to the left side of the common atrium without roofing of the coronary sinus. We need to differentiate common atrium from single atrium. Single atrium refers to a large secondum atrial septal defect and there will not be a cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet. Whereas common atrium will refer to an extension of the partial AV canal defect and so will always be associated with cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet. Epical view of a common atrium shows an eccentric mitral regurgitation jet caused by 
the cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet with associated prolapse of the bridging leaflets which directs the mitral regurgitation jet towards the posterior lateral wall of the common atrium. Interrogation of the tricuspid valve shows the presence of mild tricuspid regurgitation in this patient with common atrium. Cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet can be seen as an isolated abnormality in the absence of AV septal defects. These clefts also will have anomalous attachment of the cleft cords towards the intraventricular septum. Some of these cords can be directed towards the left ventricular outflow tract in the subbiotic area and cause a subvalvar LVOT obstruction. This is a subxiphoid short axis view of a patient who had a cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet. We can notice that contrary to a normal mitral valve, there are caudal attachment of the mitral valve towards the interventricular septum. Since the cleft and the caudal clefts are directed towards the left ventricular outflow tract, there is an obstruction to the left ventricular outflow tract in the subbiotic region. We can notice the turbulence of blood flow in the left ventricular outflow region. An epical four chamber view shows the presence of mild mitral regurgitation and left ventricular outflow tract turbulence caused by the anomalous septal attachment of the cleft anterior mitral leaflet cordae. On a parasternal long axis view, we are able to appreciate the closeness of the anterior mitral leaflet to the intraventricular septum caused by the abnormal septal caudal attachment from the cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet. This causes a left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. On a parasternal long axis view, when we use the color flow Doppler, we are able to appreciate the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction caused by this abnormal caudal apparatus. On a parasternal short axis view, we can notice the cleft is directed towards the left ventricular outflow tract a little bit more anteriorly when compared to the cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet associated with AV septal defects. The cleft of anterior mitral leaflet in AV septal defects will be directed towards the interventricular septum whereas the cleft that is seen isolated will be directed towards the left ventricular outflow tract. On the transgastric view obtained after transesophageal echocardiogram in the same patient we can notice the cleft cordae getting attached to the intraventricular septum and causing an obstruction to the subbiotic pathway. On using color Doppler we can appreciate the turbulence of the left ventricular outflow tract in the subvalvar region caused by this cleft cordae. On the mid-esophageal view of transesophageal echo, we can notice the subvalvar left ventricular outflow tract narrowing caused by this shortened cleft cordae. On the long axis view of the mid-esophageal transesophageal echo view, we can appreciate the caudal attachment from the anterior mitral leaflet towards the interventricular septum. So this narrows the left ventricular outflow tract and causes a subbiotic gradient. The color flow turbulence of the left ventricular outflow tract is caused by these anomalous cleft cordae. We can also notice that there is a mild mitral regurgitation. While in the previous example we have shown the cleft associated with mild mitral regurgitation, some of the dysplastic mitral valves associated with cleft may have severe regurgitation. In this clinical example, we can appreciate a substantial mitral regurgitation caused by a cleft in association with dysplasia of the mitral valve. 
in the second example of a dysplastic mitral valve associated with cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet, we can notice an abnormal septal attachment of the anterior mitral leaflet towards the intraventricular septum, causing a left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. The thickened leaflets are very dysplastic and cause severe mitral regurgitation. We can notice from this epical five chamber view a combination of severe left ventricular outflow tract obstruction caused by the abnormal septal cords and severe mitral regurgitation through the cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet. On the epical four chamber view, we can appreciate that the mitral valve annulus is very small. The leaflets are extremely dysplastic and thickened and cause a combination of mitral stenosis and regurgitation. The florid severe mitral regurgitation and a dilated left atrium is appreciated on this modified subsified view taken in a coronal plane. Since the dysplastic mitral valve is associated with left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, there is a significant left ventricular hypertrophy and the mitral regurgitation gets augmented due to the presence of left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Mitral valve arcade is another congenital abnormality. In this abnormality, there are multiple thick caudal apparatus from the left ventricular free wall which gets anomalously inserted to the basal portions of the mitral valve leaflets. This results in restriction of their mobility and causes mitral incompetence. As the mitral incompetence progresses, the left ventricle and the left atrium dilate result in annular dilatation which worsens the mitral regurgitation further and further. Epical four chamber view of this patient with RK shows a dysplastic mitral valve with severe mitral incompetence and a dilated left atrium. On a parasternal long axis view, we can notice the shortened thickened cardi and the shortened papillary apparatus attached very close to the mitral annulus on the posterior wall of the left ventricle. And this abnormal mitral valve cardi get inserted onto the ventricular surface of both the leaflets and they retract the leaflets and prevent them from co-opting. We can appreciate the shortened, thickened papillary apparatus and the caudal structures getting inserted onto the ventricular surface of the anterior mitral leaflet also. The shortened, thickened caudal apparatus as a part of this mitral valve arcade are well appreciated on this parasternal long axis view. On a three-dimensional echocardiogram, when we crop off the anterior wall of the left ventricle and visualize the posterior mitral leaflet along with the posterior left ventricular wall, we can notice there are multiple small papillary muscles and shortened cardi which are seen on the posterior wall of the left ventricle and getting inserted into the mitral valve leaflets at multiple points. We can see that in this three-dimensional echocardiogram, after we crop off the anterior wall of the left ventricle, we visualize the posterior mitral leaflet. We can also see that there are multiple small shortened papillary muscles seen on the posterior wall of the left ventricle with small caudal apparatus, all getting inserted to the ventricular surface of the posterior mitral leaflet shown by this arrows. In this three-dimensional echocardiogram, we are visualizing the basal portion of the left ventricle after cropping off the epical and mid portions of the left ventricle. 
we can see that there are multiple thickened short papillary muscles and shortened strut cordae. This distribution of papillary muscle and caudal apparatus is described as the mitral valve arcade. On a magnified view of the mitral valve apparatus in parastinal long axis, we can notice these shortened papillary muscles, the shortened cordae, which all get attached to the ventricular surface of both the anterior and posterior mitral leaflets. In mitral valve arcade, all these shortened strut cordae retract the mitral valve leaflets, thereby resulting in mitral incompetence. Surgical repair of this mitral valve arcade may need excision of many of these secondary caudal attachment of the mitral valve leaflets towards the free wall of the left ventricle. The retraction of the leaflets in association with annular dilatation causes severe mitral regurgitation in mitral valve arcade. Another view of the three-dimensional echocardiogram where the multiple shortened, thickened papillary muscles and caudal apparatus are shown. All these papillary muscles get inserted in the basal one-third of the left ventricle itself. They do not extend down into the mid portions of the cavity of the left ventricle as is shown in a normal mitral valve. In this epical four chamber view of a patient who clinically presented with moderate mitral regurgitation, we can appreciate the scarred echogenic papillary muscle and reduced left ventricular contractility. Whenever there is a scarring of the papillary muscle with reduction in the left ventricular function, we need to think about possibilities of anomalous origin of the left coronary artery from pulmonary artery causing coronary ischemia. When we see this picture without any color Doppler, we can appreciate the dilatation of the left ventricle, the scarred echogenic papillary muscles of Alcapa. On the parasternal short axis view, we can see the aorta and the main pulmonary artery. The left coronary artery is arising from the main pulmonary artery, indicating anomalous left coronary artery origin from pulmonary artery called as Alcapa and the dilated right coronary artery is coming off the aortic root. Dilated cardiomyopathy of any reason can result in left ventricular dilatation with secondary annular dilatation of the mitral valve and progressive annular dilatation can result in reduced cooptation between the anterior and posterior leaflets thereby resulting in secondary functional mitral incompetence. We can see the secondary mitral regurgitation due to annular dilatation in this patient with dilated cardiomyopathy. Not all congenitally stenotic mitral valves are amenable for repair. In case of mitral valve cleft with left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, all the cleft cords attached to the intraventricular septum will be divided and the cleft will be repaired using a small pericardial patch. There may be a need for a minimal left ventricular outflow tract resection also. After resection of the cleft cordae which were causing the left ventricular outflow tract narrowing, immediately after release of the cross clamp, this picture shows a wide open left ventricular outflow tract. The narrow jet of aortic regurgitation is caused by continuation of the cardiopulmonary bypass with continued aortic flow through the aortic cannula. We can appreciate that there is no left ventricular outflow tract obstruction in this patient who previously had isolated cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet resulting in 
severe left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. The cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet has been repaired with a small pericardial patch and there is no mitral incompetence that is noted. We can see a mild aortic regurgitation in this postoperative echo. Some of the extremely dysplastic mitral valves with severe mitral incompetence may have to be patch closed and if they have an associated ventricular septal defect they have to be converted into a single ventricle repair approach. In this patient a very dysplastic mitral valve has been patch closed and the tricuspid valve has been made as the only inflow for the ventricles. Some dysplastic mitral valves with regurgitation associated with annular dilatation will need ring annuloplasty to stabilize the annulus. A 3D on fast view of the left atrial side of the mitral valve after a ring annuloplasty is shown here. We can appreciate the anterior mitral leaflet curtain moving in and out in systole and diastole. We can also notice the dilated left atrium and left atrial appendage. Another patient with a mitral valve ring annuloplasty and the anterior mitral leaflet supported by a small Gotex PTFE card. Sometimes these artificial cards may be used to stabilize the leaflets. This is an example of a complete ring mitral valve annuloplasty. In smaller children, sometimes partial rings are used to allow for growth in the region of the anterior mitral annular area.